Hi, Ben. How are you? Uh, you know, we're all rotten, but <laughs> such is the world. It's hard times. For sure. I, I wanted to give you a point of reference. We actually share a very good friend. He's my childhood friend, Chaim Rosen. Oh, that's yeah. Chaim's awesome. So he's a good friend. And my uncle is Rabbi Rovinu. How oh, beautiful. Yes. And I wanted to let you know, I have an awesome nephew. His, his name is Yana Gutnik. And he wanted me to let you know that he's a, your biggest fan. Oh, that's awesome. Tell me. <laughs> <hello. laughs> this is my podcast partner. My name is Rufka Krinsky. This is my podcast partner, Ida Schottenstein. It's actually her Hebrew birthday today. Ah, Yom Huad Zemech. Yes. Uh, I wanted to share with you that um, we are very grateful that you are on our podcast today. We know you're very busy. We're watching you. We appreciate everything you share. And um, our mission on our podcast is growth-oriented. We are Chabad Orthodox women. And um, our podcast is very much about finding ways to connect spiritually to, um, to Hashem, um, also to tap into our potential and be the best versions of ourselves and share that with the world to spread the light. So this might be a little bit of a different interview to <laughs> your Stuff usual, you do, right? but um, we want you to, to uh, discuss with you courage and conviction and well, how we can all be proud Jews today. Right. Um, so thanks for thanks for being here. We're so grateful that you made the time. And so our, our theme for today is really the courage to be disliked. And I think as a Jew in the world today, it's an inevitable part of, uh, of being uh, an open and, and uh, observant Jew. And we wanted to talk to you about, about how you do it, how, how you build the courage to, to be in a world uh, with a lot of anti-Semitism and to speak the way you do and to have the courage to do so in, in uh, you know, while surrounded by a lot of hate and, and I'm sure messages that are not very pleasant to, uh, uh, to see. So can you tell us how, how do you do it? Have you always been this way? Is it something that you had to develop? And talk a little about a little bit about how you how you build the courage to be disliked. So I can sort of break down that question into two parts. One is, you know, where you find the ability to stand up in tough times. And, and the second part is how you have a, a robust enough feedback loop that you can correct yourself when, when you're doing the wrong thing, because those are really two sides of, of the same coin. So in terms of being able to stand up and, and say what I think are, are true things when when times are, are really tough, I mean, to, to a certain extent, I think that people have personality traits and, and some of them are baked into the cake, but, but a lot of it is just recognizing the reality of who you are and the reality of what the world is. And that means being realistic about what the world is, that, that it's not all going to be sunshine and, and roses and that, that believing that everybody is going to respond to you standing up for things that you believe are true with unbridled applause is the view of a child. And, and that as you get older, the world is filled with people who are going to dislike what you say. And that's just the way that the world is, but it doesn't mean that what you're saying is untrue or wrong. In some cases, it means that what you're saying is, is deeply necessary. And the more flack you're taking, as they say, the more you're actually over the target. And when it, when it comes to you know just the truth of being a Jew in the world, that's not something that you can change. And this is something that Rav Soloveitchik talked a lot about, the, the idea of that, that there are two covenants, the covenant of fate and the covenant of destiny. And unfortunately, um, yeah, the, the Jewish people tend to be you know locked into the covenant of fate more than they tend to embrace the covenant of destiny. He talked about the covenant of fate is the idea that that we're all locked together in in this cosmic deal, essentially, with God, this covenant that that is unbreakable. And you can try to run away from it. You can try to run away from what you are or how the world is going to see you, but the world is going to put you right back in there, no matter what you think or what you feel. And you're seeing that in Israel right now, where where Jews are Jews, whether they are completely Chiloni or whether they're completely Dati. It, it doesn't seem to, you can be Haredi or you can be a, a left-wing person who was murdered at Kibbutz Beri and you're seen by the world in exactly the same way because that's the covenant of faith. It's just the reality of the world and you can accept that and and embrace it. And if you do accept that and embrace it, then it becomes what Rav Soloveitch called the covenant of destiny. At that point, you've embraced what it is that you're supposed to be on the planet. And you can turn what, what could be a, a really tough and, and horrible situation into something that is positive, not just for you, but for the world at large. Because the reality is that the world respects people who stand up and speak on behalf of truth. They, they respect people who, who stand tall for what they believe in. I'm very frequently asked why I wear a kippah publicly. And the answer is it never really occurred to me not to wear a kippah publicly. I've always worn a kippah. And so the idea of taking it off to please people would have been weird. And what I found is that that actually tends to earn more respect than the opposite way around. And hiding what you are and who you are, people can see it anyway. And so hiding behind you know, some something to try and obscure that 
doesn't tend to benefit you and it doesn't tend to benefit your cause. And there's the, yeah. the second question, which is how you deal with, with the, the incoming. And, and there, the only answer is that you have to have uh, enough of a shell and uh, enough of group people who have your best interests at heart that you can tell the difference in friend and foe. And two is that you do have to leave yourself open to a feedback loop where if you get something wrong, you can correct it. And it's easy to err in either direction. It's easy to have so close an echo chamber that you can't hear anything from the outside. And so everything you say becomes inherently right and true and, and you make mistakes, but, but nobody around you is willing to tell you that. And it's also easy to get overtaken from the outside where every critique of you is true and so you tear yourself down. And so finding that balance is, is tough, but I think doable and necessary. Did you come to it on your own or were you raised in that way in a home that with those values? Uh, I was definitely raised that way. So my, my, my parents are, are, are you know very much in line with my values uh, or I'm in line with theirs to be more accurate. Uh, and um, my dad uh, particularly was, was always uh, a big booster of the idea that I should speak truth where I saw it. Uh, you know, I was, I, I've had a skill set since I was very, very young. I mean, I was winning speech contests for high schoolers when I was in third grade. Mm -hmm. So he could tell very, you know, very young that I was a really good writer, that I was a really good speaker. And when people ask him now, like, are they surprised at what's happened in terms of my career and, and how many people I speak to? He, he always says no, <laughs> that he's not, um, because the, the truth is I was doing this kind of stuff at a very, very early age. I mean, I found a paper from when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old talking about the Clinton impeachment from like 1998. Uh, so I guess I was 13 or 14. Um, and so the, the kind of, you know, the involvement in these sorts of issues uh, has, has always been part of, of what I do. Uh, and also just the, the idea of being proud to, to be Jewish because Judaism stands for values, not in terms of ethnic Judaism. I, I really care very little for ethnic Judaism, but, but in terms of being proud of Jewish values and the things that the Jews are supposed to stand for, again, that, that's, that's something that's inculcated from a, a very young age. And either you can embrace it or you can run away from it, but you're going to be held to account for it. Yeah. You know, what you said earlier reminds me of a quote that Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs had said, non-Jews respect Jews who respect themselves. And, you yeah. know, ultimately you see when someone respects themselves, you're going to gain respect from others, but somehow people don't, don't end up seeing it that way in the moment. They feel that they have to conform. And we, we see that you wear your yarmulke proudly wherever you go. And I, even someone before we did this interview now, someone had said to me, he knows personally a friend of his who was inspired to put on tefillin because of you. Um, and we wanted to know how, what led you to become, to become orthodox. So my family came from when I was 11. Uh, so for those who don't speak Yiddish uh, or or from uh, from just means Orthodox. Uh, so we we were Balt Shuva, meaning that we weren't Orthodox and then we became Orthodox. Uh, and that happened when I was 11. My parents had been moving in that direction for a long time. So they, when I was very little, were attending an Orthodox congregation down in Venice Beach, but they were driving at the time to get to the to the congregation. They were moving in that direction. As I got older, you, you sort of have to make a choice about how you want to educate your kids and under what framework you wish to educate your kids. And so my parents decided that that it was worthwhile to become more orthodox. So I was sent to Jewish day school when I was in, uh, let's see, it would have been fifth grade is when I went to Jewish day school for the first time. And I would come home and I would say to my parents, you know, they say in school, we're supposed to do this and we're not doing this. So what's the deal? And there are two ways you can respond to that. One of those is to say, well, your school is wrong. And the other way is to say, well, we're wrong. My parents responded in the latter way. Uh, and so they started making moves in a more orthodox direction because the idea, again, is you have to provide your kids with a holistic framework for for how they live their lives. Uh, and so, you know, I, I remember eating at Kentucky Fried Chicken, but, you know, I, I remember when we became orthodox also, and when we started keeping full Shabbat, when we moved into from a community that was really not Jewish, did not have an Eruv, did not have a shul nearby that we could actually walk to, to a place where, where we could do that. Uh, that was in Burbank, California. So we, we lived in Burbank until I was, I think, 10, uh, 10 or 11. Uh, and then we moved to the North Hollywood community when I was 11, probably. And and basically, we were there for another 20 years. Uh, we ended up staying there. Now, obviously, we live in Florida, uh, thanks to the collapse of, of California as a, as a polity. But uh, the, you know, the, the, that move was, was something that was done familially. It wasn't done just be, me by, by myself. Uh, and then, of course, when, when you get older, you start really looking into the roots of your own religion. What is it that you believe? What is it that you, you think is important about what you do? And, and you know, what allows you to both be part of the community because you're, you can't remove yourself from the community, but also um, to you know, do the things that, that you think are, are true and worthwhile every day, which is why I think it's important that there's so much diversity, even inside the Orthodox community, about how people think about particular issues uh, and how they address the day. How do you handle the criticism that you encounter on a constant basis? Or how do you prepare I mean, yourself emotionally and for for such things? I mean, it's very rough. Uh, I, in the, the to pretend that I'm not a human being would be silly. Uh, it, it is it is very rough. I would say the single best move that I've made uh, was now it's about five years ago. My my wife could see that Twitter was just wrecking me. 
uh, and that you spend every, <laughs> Twitter's a very bad machine. I mean, tw Twitter is a, it's great for getting the news, but also it happens to be an enormous feedback loop of people who are following you. And it makes you self-censored and narcissistic because you're checking your mentions. And especially if you're like me and you have millions and millions, of, I mean, I have 6.2 million followers on Twitter. You can see what people are saying about you literally every second of every day. And that is not a healthy thing. And so about five years ago, when I trended for the umpteenth time, I, I, I trend on Twitter, I don't know, once every two, three weeks, uh, my my wife said to me, like, this is not good. And it's and it's wrecking your life and it's wrecking my life and you're, you, it'll wreck your day. And you would have been better off not even knowing you were trending until the following day. So just take it off your phone. There's no purpose. Like if you need to check Twitter, if something really bad is happening, somebody who's a friend or member of your business is going to call you and tell you you need to respond in real time. But other than that, you really don't need to be on top of it like that. And she was totally right. And I took it off my phone. And that made a big difference because I don't actually need feedback from random people. I just need to be told when there's an actual you know, political danger or something that's said that's wrong that needs to be corrected or, or whatever it is. And so my so, so engagement- So who, who would you take your feedback from? Uh, so I, I have members of of my sort of friendship community in my business. So my business partners, Jeremy Boring, Caleb Robinson, I'll take feedback from them. My producers on my show who are constantly seeing what's happening with the show, they'll call me if there's a problem. There are people who work in my company and it's literally their job to make sure, you know, how the, that, that the PR branding of me and of, and of the company uh, are done in a particular way. And so if there's something that I got wrong, my producers, for example, have free reign on my show to tell me if they think that I overstepped a line, and then I will tell them if I think that I didn't, or maybe they're right. And so that, that right. sort of feedback loop is is really, really useful. And I think that, you know, it's a it's a quality that I've cultivated over the course of a lot of years, which is, you know, being open to the possibility that what I said is not correct or wrong, or that I need to correct it. And so that really doesn't bother me nearly as much as making a mistake. Making a mistake really bothers me a lot. Uh, and and so, you know, if I can preempt that by having that open feedback loop, then that that is definitely better. Now, as far as among family and friends, uh, we have a very tight knit community where I live in Florida. Uh, we have a lot of friends over there. Uh, we have a lot of family who live close by. I, my, my parents, two of my sisters live within a mile and a half radius. Um, my, my wife's parents live within a, a mile radius. And of course, we have, you know, a, a very bustling and thriving community, all of whom are, are tend to be like minded about particularly Jewish issues and 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 is and issues surrounding Israel, but also I think in general politically like minded. So there there, there are a lot of places where I can go to to get feedback that that I trust. Right. I also have I also have friends on the other side of the aisle. So so very often you know I'll, I'll get a, a text from you know somebody who I don't who I don't agree with all the time, and they'll say, right. "Do you mean what you seem to have meant when you said X?" And I'll explain it to them, or I'll go on the show the next day and I'll say, "Like I, I it sounded like I said this, but I really meant was this." And so you know, you try to to keep the 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 thread that runs through is people who have your best interest at heart. Uh, there are a lot right. of people out there who want to criticize you and rip you down who don't have your best interest at heart. Trying right. to tell you know friend from foe is it can it can sometimes be difficult in this space, but it's important. So you're you're really blocking out the outside noise and just taking feedback from the people that you feel care about you. Yes, or, or and people who also care about the issue, meaning that right. even if they don't care about me particularly, they might say this is this is not the best way to approach the issue. Right, and and so sometimes you know that that's useful as well. Yeah. Do you have any mentors that you look to for, you know, advice or maybe on, on decision making or how to move forward? Difficult. Uh, I mean, I, I more have I would say you know people who I collaborate with uh, on that sort of stuff. So again, many of the same people I've just mentioned are, are people who I have conversations sort of along the lines of, should we do this speech in this place? Should I do a show on X? Do you think that, um, do you think we should make a video about this? And it's more like me bouncing ideas off people as a sounding board. Uh, I would say it's less like there's, you know, old man on mountain, I go to him and I and I ask him for for his advice uh, on things. That, that, that I don't tend to do, but I do tend to take kind of temperature of the room. So I usually mm -hmm. have, there's somewhere between five and 10 people where if I have to make a big decision, I will call them and ask sort of, you know, what they think of the decision. I'll take, not that one piece of advice, but like from all of them. And very often that allows me to see, you know, all sides of the issue before I make a call. So have you had to hold back because of um, the people around you have said to you, you know what, I think maybe you're going to cross the line if you share a certain opinion of yours. Like, do you feel that you've had to hold back in a lot of ways? I mean, all the time. I mean, I, less so in terms of position and more so in terms of emotion. So I'm not known as a particularly emotional specimen, uh, and my show is not known <laughs> as as somebody who, as, as a show that's that's really emotional in nature. Obviously, the last three weeks have been uh, incredibly, incredibly difficult on both a personal and professional level. And so there have definitely been times, one time in particular on the show, uh, where I responded to a thing in a way that I, I didn't particularly like, and we were pre-recording the show. So my producer came to me and was like, "Do you are you sure you want to put it that way?" And I said, "No, you should just cut it." Uh, in the heat of the moment, when you're responding to a thing. Uh, it's, yeah. you know, it, that can happen. Now, again, I tend to be pretty good at retaining my my kind of reserve uh, and and my remove. 
it, it's a lot more difficult when you're talking about what's been happening over the past few weeks and when you see the maddening spectacle of literally millions of people marching in solidarity with people who wish to wipe Jews off the planet. Like that, that is um, upsetting on a, on a level that uh, I've not experienced in my career before. And I've gone through a fair number of these sorts of news cycles in which I'm the target of the news cycle or the top of the news cycle. This one where you're watching an obvious attempt at genocide and the world, many in the world are responding by engaging in alternatively Holocaust denial or moral relativism or moral equivocation or blaming it on the Jews uh, they, and, and then attempting to go after you personally as an advocate for, for the opposite position that, that, you know, there, there are times when it can get a little heated. And so it's good to have somebody in your ear saying like, you know, that I know exactly how I feel, but you need to like, this is, this is not the way you ought to articulate it. And so how do you work through that? So again, it, it's usually a momentary lapse. So yeah. I'm a pretty in control type person. And so like uh, the, the the thing that I'm remembering a couple of weeks ago was that we played a clip of a particular congresswoman saying a particular thing. And uh, and I responded <laughs> incredibly, uh, incredibly uh, emotionally. It was a very volatile response. You can hear it on the show, but there was a couple of sentences that we cut uh, that were inappropriate for children's ears. Uh, and uh, and my, uh, my producers came to me uh, right after the show and they said, uh, are you sure that you want to say this? And I said, just cut those two sentences. Leave the rest of right. it, but cut those two sentences. Like when you're in the moment, as as everybody knows, when you're in the yeah. heat of the moment, sometimes you say things that even if you mean them, like, and by the way, I really meant the things that I said. And, uh, you know, I, if it had gone out on air, I wouldn't have been particularly perturbed, but I, I didn't like the way that it was articulated, um, particularly because uh, it would have taught some some young people some words they probably shouldn't know. Um, but right. yes. <laughs> have you ever felt perturbed um, doing something live and then learned something from it? Uh, yes. So the, the best example of that is there's an interview that I did with the BBC a few years ago uh, where I was sort of sandbagged. So essentially, I was doing a, an interview was supposed to be about my book, The Right Side of History, which came out, I believe, in 2017. Uh, and the and the book was a big bestseller. It sold you know, half a million copies or whatever. And so the, the interview is just supposed to be about the book. And I was not told who the interviewer was. And the interviewer, it turns out, is very famous for being uh, incredibly combative, um, for for coming at guests. And so I was just told it was like a normal report. Okay, so I get on the air and the person decides not to interview me about the book at all, but simply to read me bad old tweets, right? To find things that I'd written in 2010, which I had then retracted or contextualized or whatever it was, and then just do that for like 20 minutes. And so I sit there for 20 minutes and I'm just taking it. And I, over time, I started to get hot under the collar. I was tired. It was the end of a long day of doing PR and all this kind of stuff. And I made several errors in the interview. Uh, error number one is I assumed that I that I could kind of read the person's politics by what he was saying. Uh, and so I, I believed that because he was being incredibly combative, this meant that he was a member of the political left, when in fact, he's sort of a centrist, maybe right on some issues, kind of left on other issues, more heterodox. Uh, so I said that, which was wrong. You shouldn't speak out of ignorance. Uh, two, I fell back on, this is the one I regret most. I fell back on kind of an ego play, which is always a mistake, which is I said, the reason you're attacking me right now is because I'm famous and you're not. Uh, which mm -hmm. number one is a, is a bad look. Uh, and number two also was not true. This person happens to be famous in Britain. Now, I'm from America, so don't care, but it doesn't matter. Like it, it's still a bad play. Uh, and then number three, after like 20 solid minutes of this, I got up and I walked out of the interview. Like I took off the microphone. I said, listen, this has been, you. this was basically a sandbagging. I, I hope you got what you needed. And I walked out. You know, when you lose your cool, it never tends to work out particularly well. And so losing your cool is a very hard one, particularly in volatile times with, with emotions running high. So that, that's when the challenge is the greatest, for sure. And all of those were errors. And, and I've acknowledged those errors publicly uh, and tried to, you know, and tried to say, like, when you make a mistake. I mean, I, I, went on, I went on Twitter before the interview even aired, and I said that this person, you know, shellacked me in the interview. Now, do I still think it was an unfair tactic? Yeah, but, you know, you got, you got to own it when you make a mistake. Well, that, that's courageous. That's courageous of you to do that. To admit when you make a mistake. Yeah, it's not fun, but you have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so how can you inspire our listeners to be courageous and, and stand up for themselves, stand up for others and stand up for, for the Jewish people, everyone in their own way? I mean, in, you're very educated in, in politics and, and the areas that you um, debate, et cetera. And, but some people, it's just about being a proud Jew. And, and standing strong in, and being proud of who you are. Do you have any wisdom to share? In, in, I mean, in I, what, what I would say that? is that, you know, as, as most psychologists would say, you don't get to pick the situation you're in, but you get to choose how to respond to that situation. Uh, and Victor, so, Frankl, Victor Frankl. Exactly. Uh, yeah. and, and so if you are, you know, if the reality of the world is that you are going to be identified as a Jew, 
if the reality of the world is that it doesn't matter whether you're right or whether you're left or whether you're secular or whether you're or whether you're Haredi, none of that matters. In the end, this is how you're going to be identified. Then you can either embrace it and you can make it part of your mission and you can stand up for yourself or you can allow yourself to be cowed and embarrassed and browbeaten. Uh, and that's your choice. But the, the thing you can't choose is the surrounding world. And I think that because we live in such a rich society and such a liberal society, people tend to think that they can choose how the world responds to them. And that is a mistake politically. It's a mistake personally. It's a mistake emotionally. You can't choose how the world responds to you. All you can do is choose how you respond to the world. And so if you respond to the world in, in a way that you feel like you can sleep at night, in a way that you feel proud of what you've stood up for, then I think that that's, that's really the only thing that, that, that in the end is going to matter. If you can feel proud before God, if you can feel proud before before your people, before your family, about the things that you've done, that's the that's the thing that's going to allow you to live a fulfilling life. Because again, things are going to get ugly, and pretending it's all going to be wonderful is 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 a lie. Uh, the only thing that that you can assure is your response to the situation. What would you say to like the Jews in Europe who are afraid to walk around with the yarmulke? Let's say at shul they would wear at synagogue they would wear their yarmulke and then take it off. I yeah, I mean. Again, I, I don't blame anybody for not putting themselves in a, in a violent situation. I've said this before. Like that I, I'm not going to walk around a high crime area of the United States waving my wallet around, right? And, and I'm not going to walk around in certain districts of Paris uh, wearing a kippah. I wouldn't. I mean, like I'm somebody who wears a, I wear a baseball cap, right? Like there, there are certain things that you do just on, on a personal safety level because you know exactly where you are. However, if you are living in a safe place in the United States and you're an Orthodox Jew, you should be wearing your kippah. And th this does drive me crazy. Like to, to, to pretend that you're walking around in like the 19th district of, of Paris when you're actually just walking around in Miami or when you're actually just walking around uh, in, in Fairlawn or something. Like that's, that's, that's not the same thing. And, and so when you go to your doctor's office and it's the office that you run and you're the owner of the office and you're not wearing a kippah because you're, you're gonna quote unquote alienate clients. I, I don't see the rationale for that. I, and I've never really understood the rationale for that. That seems something that's like a couple generations ago when people were afraid that casual anti-Semitism was going to destroy their business. They wouldn't be able to make a living if they, but let me assure you, if your last name is Goldstein, you're not wearing a kippah, you're not hiding anything. It's not, it's not as though nobody doesn't, nobody knows. It's a big secret. Like that's that's not how any of this works. And so what what that does, I, a lot of people also are afraid that if they put on a kippa or if they openly identify as Jewish, then they're, they're going to be held up as an example of the Jews. And, and they say, I don't want to speak for the Jews. I don't, guess what? Too late. That's how it is. I mean, that's just, that is how it is. I mean, the way that anti-Semitism works, that every Jew is considered a, a spokesperson for the Jews in all the worst ways. And that's so you may as well be a spokesperson, you know, for your religion and for what you believe in, in all the best ways, because otherwise what you're going to get is precisely what anti-Semites do, which is they find some Jew doing something awful somewhere. And they say, this is a stand in for all Jews. It's not like that person made themselves a stand in for all Jews. They just decide to do that. So again, th this is just a recognition of reality is the first, it, first step toward happiness. And I understand that we have been taught precisely the opposite in Western civilization now. That, that happiness can only be found by rejecting reality and pursuing your dreams. Well, sometimes your dreams are stupid and reality still maintains. Are you surprised by the anti-Semitism today and, and the general worldview? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I am shocked by the level of it, that, that, that the, the willingness, mainly because it's so open. Like, that's the part that I find kind of shocking. Like, I always assume that, there are hu that there's a huge amount of latent anti-Semitism on the intersectional left. Not so latent. I mean, pretty obvious. But because I, I watch it closely so I can see it. And my job is to see, you know, the grass when it first begins to sprout. And then people only tend to notice it when it's like a full blown field. Um, but so I, I'm not particularly surprised, but I am surprised at the openness of it. Uh, and I'm surprised at how far willing people are willing to say these things out loud. I mean, the, the fact that like everyone knew the Black Lives Matter was an anti-Semitic organization. I mean, there was just no question about that from the outside if you were watching. But to actually put out like a logo of a of a Hamas terrorist in a paraglider with a Palestinian flag after a Hamas paraglider murdered 200, like a bunch of them murdered 260 people in the electronic dance music festival in Southern Israel. Like that's, that's an astonishing level of brazenness. And so the brazenness of it, I think has, has shocked me. I think the, the willingness of the world, the, the, the so-called, you know, even many of these so-called pro-Israel people that to, to sort of flip back into their status quo ante mentality, that shocked me. I, I thought that it would take longer than two weeks for people to get past, you know, burned babies and raped yeah. women. But apparently it took like, I don't know, a week and a half for everybody to go right back to moral equivalence, cycle of violence. We need a two-state solution. Like all the things that they were saying before, they're now saying after in exactly the same way. So that that, that I found a little bit shocking. Um, so yeah, it, it's been it's been enraging, honestly. It's, it's, it's an enraging thing. 
uh, and and all the best minds, all the best people say, all the intellectuals, you know, th that kind of stuff, going right back to the pseudo sophistication that they were preaching beforehand, as though nothing actually happened, and and yeah, you know, that 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 has been shocking to me. Uh, and I'm I'm rarely shocked in politics, like truly rarely shocked. I find myself to be pretty cynical about politics because I watch it literally every day. Um, but the the level of shock to me, because again, when when you see something like October seventh, the worst event for Jews in eighty years, uh, when when you see something like that. And then the world that has promised you since you were a child that never again is real and that they would never allow anything like this to happen again immediately goes into appeasement mode, weapons down, ceasefire, pressure on Israel, the, 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 the Jews everywhere need to, need to stop with their nonsense and really just kind of get over it. Like the, 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 the unbelievable alacrity with which the world jumped back on its old narrative, uh, it, it, that did shock me. And again, I'm rarely shocked. And we see this throughout our history. So I guess we shouldn't be that shocked, but we also have seen that we have prevailed and we've moved forward and we have um, we have outshone the negativity. How can we do that? How do, how do you see ourselves moving forward? So first of all, I think that it's important to recognize my wife is very big on this, recognize that we're not alone. There, there are real people who actually are allies. There, there are, in fact, a lot of people who truly do believe never again. So we see a lot of bad rallies at university campuses, which have been entirely taken over by, yes. by people with garbage ideologies. But there are a huge number of Americans, 70 odd percent of Americans who are incredibly sympathetic to Israel in this current battle who want to see Hamas wiped off the map. And so it's easy to, to kind of focus in on the worst as opposed to many of the best. Right. And there are a lot of people who are supportive. So we should remember that too. Yes. The, the solidarity of the Jewish people all over the world has been astonishing. I mean, to, yeah. to watch how Israel flipped from, I mean, we were, so we were in Israel uh, for Sukkot. We left right before Simchat Torah. We actually got, we got home the day before the attacks happened. We, we left Yerushalayim uh, on the Friday and then Shabbos morning, I'm walking to show my security comes and tells me what's going on. Uh, and um, and so, you know, you, when we were there, I mean, I'm, I'm meeting with all the politicians and this is what I do for a living. And so there's a lot of talk about like the divisions inside Israeli society, how Jew was divided from Jew, how much kind of negativity there was. I remember from where we were staying in Jerusalem, we could hear the protests at the president's house on a Saturday night, just a random Saturday night. And so there was this all this talk uh, inside Israel and outside Israel about these kind of deep running divisions that were going to threaten the few, and, and then something like this happens and you see Tel Aviv kitchens koshering themselves to feed Orthodox Orthodox soldiers. You see Chilonim who are now asking for pairs of tzitzit so that they can act in solidarity with, with you see Haredim who are signing up for the army, right? You're, you're, you're starting to see, you know, a, a solidarity like nothing I think we've ever seen in our lifetimes. It certainly surpasses 73 in terms of the global Jewish support for, for all of this. Everybody in my community figuring out how to get supplies to members of the IDF reservists who are called up and who may need additional supplies. People reaching into their pocket to try and help families who have been displaced uh, in the north of Israel and in the Gaza. Like that's been an astonishing, astonishing thing. And finding, sol and finding solace in the fact that, you know, again, Turning that covenant of fate into the covenant of destiny is the story of the last couple of weeks for for Jews all over the world. And the kind of embrace of that, I think, has been an amazing, amazing thing to watch. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much darkness, but there's also so much light. And uh, and thank you for shining your light on the world. And I, and I hope you continue to do it. You're still young, but you have a, a whole lot of years ahead of you. We, we appreciate everything that you do. I, I just wanted to ask if you could, if you had a billboard headline that you could share with the world and everybody everyone could see it. What would it say? Right now, you want the inspirational one or you want the political one? Uh, the, the political we'll, we'll, both. we'll take I mean, both. We'll take a two-sided one. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, so they, the, the political one is not everyone thinks like you. Not everyone thinks like you. If the yeah, world understood not everybody thinks like you, then they would be much better off. And because we blind ourselves to that by imagining that that the world's worst people, the only reason they're doing this is because, you know, I would only do this if if I were victimized in some way. That, that, that sort of, narcissistic mentality is likely to get the West destroyed. So the, they don't think like you would be would be one of them. And then on an inspirational level, uh, I would just say that it's in your hands would be it. Like virtually everything, virtually all problems in your life, aside from health, uh, are, are problems that are largely in your hands. And even if the problem is not in your hands, it's better to approach the problem as though it is in your hands. Um, because if, if you approach it as though it's external to you, it's something that's victimizing you, you're unlikely to, to see success. Whereas if you approach every problem with the attitude that it's, fixable by you, solvable by you, mitigatable by you, uh, then you're likely to succeed far more often than you fail. Well, the, the world's problems are not like we can't, it's not in our hands what's going on in Israel right now. Well, that, 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 they, you know, they, but, but it's better to approach it as though it is. 
Right. right? I mean, you're and right. How it's would you do that? It as the, I mean, on a PR level, that means that you speak out clearly and openly on these issues. On a, on a material level, it means that you use your means in order to support people who are in need in Israel. If you're in Israel, it means that you actually perform acts of solidarity with your neighbors. Again, it-, it, it on, a, the, on a spiritual the, level, it means to pray, to do acts of goodness and kindness. A hundred percent. I mean, and by, by the way, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in Rambam's you know, sort of believe in, in Hilchot Yisidei Torah, that, that when you do that sort of stuff, it's not just that that has emanations in higher sphero, which is a more Kabbalistic idea, which is not super, that's not really Rambam's thing. What Rambam says is that it makes you a better person, makes society better, like all those things have an impact in the world and people can see you doing those things. And that has an impact in the world as well. And so again, it's all in God's hands in the end anyway, but whatever you can do is what's, you know, it's, it's up to you to start the task, even if you can't finish it, right? So it's in our hands. And I, I think that you've given us some really great tools and insight into how we can take things in our hands. A quote. We usually end our podcast with a quote. What's what's your favorite one? Or what is one that you find relevant for today that inspires you? Ooh. Um, or any or a quote that resonates. Uh, so, the, so this one's from uh, Yeshaya, right? Utu etu v'sufar dabru dabru v'lo yakum ki imanu kel. Right, let them, let them plan their plans and let them speak their words. None of it matters for God is with us. Amen. Yeah. And may we prevail. And, Hashem. and, and I think that w- when you speak of um, how inspiring when you were in Israel, how inspiring it is that, that the nation is united. I think that's coming from that the soul within us. It's, it's the pride. It's the pride that is missing that we need to bring out more and more. For sure. And that's that's, on a that's personal why we're here talking to you today. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's true on a personal level. It's true on a national level for Jews. It's true for the West as a whole. I mean, if they don't find that pride in, in their own values, then it's going to be a dark future. But if they do find that pride, uh, then the world can be a much better place. Yeah, the Lubavitch Rebbe said that if you see what's broken in the world, then then it's you who needs repair. But if you see what needs to be fixed, then you found a piece of God and a tikkun olam. So I guess that's a, a good good message to, to end off with. And then I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time. Be here Thank you so much. Join us on From the Inside Out.